what we do here is go back, 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 back. Hi, and welcome to Chapter 3, Early African Societies in the Bantu Migrations of Mr. Toyama's AP World History. We're going to actually do Chapter 3 and 4 in one video to try and plow through some of this information since Chapters 1 through 8 is a very small section of your AP World History uh, test that's coming up uh, here very soon. Uh, as usual, here's our chapter overview. Cultivation and domestication of animals transform African cultures like cultures in Southwest Asia into distinctive societies with more formal states, specialized labor, and more elaborate cultural traditions. The region around the Nile River, Egypt to the north and Nubia to the south, supported the fastest growing and most complex societies in Africa. These societies are notable for the following characteristics. First, centralized political authority embodied in the absolute ruler, the pharaoh in Egypt, and in the person of the king in the region of Kush, or Nubia. Next, Imperialist expansion in the 2nd millennium BCE as the Egyptian army pushed into Palestine, Syria, and North Africa, and south into Nubia, and as the Kushites later conquered Egypt and expanded their influence to the south. Next, highly stratified and patriarchal societies based on an agricultural economy. Then, the development of industries, transportation, and trade networks that facilitated economic growth and the intermingling of cultural traditions. Next, the writing systems, hieroglyphic, heric, heratic, Demotic and Coptic scripts in Egypt and the yet to be translated Meoric inscriptions in Nubia. Organized religious traditions that included the worship of Ammon and Re or Ra, sun gods, and the cult of Osiris, pyramid building, and in Egypt, mummification of the dead. At the same time that Egypt and Nubia were becoming increasingly complex societies, the Bantu speaking peoples to the south were undertaking gradual migrations from their homeland in the west central Africa and displacing or intermingling with the foraging peoples of the forests. These migrations and others helped spread both agricultural technology and after 1000 BCE, iron metallurgy throughout sub-Saharan Africa. All right, so first up we have the development of African agriculture. The Sahara Desert was originally a highly fertile region. It was an area that uh, was supportive to crops and to farms. But uh, Western Sudan region it has nomadic herders show up around 9,000 uh, BCE. They domesticate cattle around 7,500 BCE, and they later cultivate sorghum, which is like a type of what you would think of like wheat or yeast, uh, and they have yams. Uh, increasingly diverse uh, types of grain is grown there and different types of food are grown there. Then there's a widespread desiccation of the Sahara around 5000 BCE. Desiccation is uh, basically the wearing away or destroying, and so it becomes more of the desert we know today that's associated with the Sahara. There's this thing called the Gift of the Nile. This is a gradual, predictable flooding that happens uh, every year in the Nile. And what's nice about it is uh, in Egypt, if you can see on the map on the left, Egypt benefited greatly from this because as Egypt has that uh, same kind of silt that we talked about in the last chapter that is conducive to growing crops, but if you can't get water to your very fertile land, then you're going to have some problems. But since the Nile actually floods its banks and gets very full and actually overflows at a very predictable and gradual rate, they were able to harness the power of the Nile every year and use that to grow their crops. And it just so happened to coincide with the times they were planting, with the times they were watering. And uh, they also had these things called antilluvial deposit. Uh, antilluvial deposits are uh, supporting agricultural society because this is the gradual wearing down by the river of either rocks or different types of things along the side of the rivers that actually deposits nutrients into the soil. And by depositing those nutrients, they're able to have better farmland and better uh, crop yield every year. The gift of the Nile, as it becomes to be known, is still happening to this day. Yes, even with some drought conditions and, and uh, water uh, scarcity issues around the world, they still have an annual flooding, maybe not in the same uh, ways that they did in the past, but it's still a very beneficial part in what makes Egypt uh, a very fertile region even to this day. Early, early agriculture in the Nile Valley. Uh, around 10,000 BCE, migrants from the Red Sea Hills, northern Ethiopia uh, show up. They introduce collection of wild grains and they have their language roots in Coptic. So Coptic is what is uh, spoken by many Egyptians today. It's a very um, 
like old language, but it still has uses, just like how Greek is a very old language, but Greek is still being used today with some uh, variations and changes. Around 5000 BCE, Sudanic cultivators from the Sudan are, and herders migrate to the Nile River Valley. Around 5000 BCE, those, uh, the Sudan dries up, like we talked about a couple slides ago, and those uh, people who are farmers and those herders need to move to the River Valley because they're following their crops and they're following their animals to make sure that they're able to survive uh, now that the Sudan is dried up. Uh, they adapt to the seasonal flooding of the Nile through construction of dikes, which are cutaways into the side of uh, rivers, which uh, kind of hold up water. And what's nice about that is it protects your area of uh, where you want to build. Like there are many uh, dikes in like the Netherlands or what we would associate with like the Dutch areas of the world. And they actually hold back the ocean. But in this instance, they hold back uh, the water of the Nile, allowing them to build alongside of it. But also it allows you to store a lot of water long term for your crops. They also develop waterways, which are ways for boats to go up and down the, the Nile. The Nile runs north in uh, the world. And so what's nice about that is since it runs north uh, up to the Mediterranean, you're able to get a lot of um, water stored by kind of building those waterways and dikes and get yourself to the Mediterranean without a lot of um, rowing against the stream. Then they end up in having villages that are dotted along the Nile uh, by about 4000 BCE. So villages are springing up uh, pretty regularly uh, around 4000 BCE, taking advantage of that natural flooding and also the uh, advantage of having the waterways for uh, the Nile to kind of shoot off of. There's an impact on political organization. As in Mesopotamia, there's a need for formal organization of public affairs. We talked about how the only way you can get a society, you can get an urban uh, like central center is with having uh, an overarching kind of government or group of people who oversee all of society and all of public affairs, even on a small level. Uh, so they need to have uh, this, this group be able to maintain order and organize community projects, especially organizing how the water should be used and distributed during uh, the flooding of the Nile. In Egypt, they start off with simple local irrigation projects. So they're building waterways, they're building cutaways, they're building all these different uh, ways to get the water from the Nile to their farms, which could be miles away even. Uh, it was rural rather than heavily urban development. So think about like farmland with lots of people dotted kind of far away from each other, not heavily urban, like centralized. So when you remember back to the picture that we saw in Mesopotamia of uh, the ziggurats and those cities that were tightly packed together, well, that's not what we're really looking at here with um, Egypt. We're looking at more of a spread out community with farms that kind of space out the people. And through this, trade networks develop. What's nice about uh, having a government is they're able to oversee currency and by overseeing currency you're able to have standardized weights and measures and so you can start to get people who are able to say oh i want to buy so much wheat you guys have so much wheat we need to trade your wheat for our coinage and they're able to buy and sell and those networks start to develop especially with the use of um, using the nile to move your boats up and down the rivers there's a unification of egypt the legendary conqueror menace uh, around 3100 unifies the Egyptian kingdom. He gets all the Egyptian cities under his control. He's sometimes identified with Narmer. It's, it's kind of unclear what exactly they are and who they are and which one did a lot of the same things. The tradition is he's the founder of Memphis and he's the, it becomes the cultural and political center of ancient Egypt. Memphis, before uh, Cairo, was the uh, original uh, it, the capital of, of Egypt back during this time. Through this process of overseeing the unification of Egypt, he institutes the uh, rule of the pharaoh. Now the pharaoh is what we would kind of understand as like a king or the head ruler. He claimed direct descent from the gods, that he was a son of God, and uh, he was an absolute, absolute ruler, meaning he had absolute power like we talked about in some of the other cultures we've looked at. Uh, they were so absolute that they believed that they would need to even be taken care of in the afterlife. So what's the best way to make sure you're taken care of in the afterlife is having your slaves buried with you. And if you get all, when you die, all your slaves were locked into your uh, burial chamber with you. And this tradition began around 2600 BCE. Now the most powerful uh, kingdoms and uh, under 
the Egyptian banner is during the Archaic period, which is 3100 to 2660 BCE, and the Old Kingdom, which is 2660 to 2160 BCE. Then many of you find this picture very famous. It's the pyramids. It's a symbol of the pharaoh's authority and divine status. If you think about it, uh, this is kind of an interesting symbol. A, a triangle isn't a very natural geometric shape, especially one that would have been so perfectly manicured in the days when it was first created. And uh, it also kind of draws your eyes towards the sky where they believe the gods lived. And it was a very simple model that... Uh, was able to express a, an immense amount of power held by the pharaoh. So whoever was able to commission this uh, act of building these giant triangles in the middle of nowhere uh, was a testimony to their ability to get all of the people and all the resources to build these amazing things. If you think about it, if you wanted to build a uh, giant pyramid today, you'd have to have lots of workers, lots of food to feed those workers, lots of land to house them, to take care of them. You might need hospitals. You need to be so organized as a community to have this building project that you would need to be uh, a very important and powerful person to demand that all these things happen under your leadership. The largest of the pyramids is Kifu, or Khufu, uh, also known as Cheops. It's a uh, 2.3 uh, meter high limestone blocks and the average weight of one of those single blocks is 2.5 tons which is thousands of pounds if you think about it that would have taken a ton of people moving a lot of weight across a very large distance because that rock wasn't found very near there it was a, a bit of ways and uh, the original role for these burial chambers was for or excuse me the pyramid was burial chambers for the pharaohs uh, the pyramids were basically giant uh, tombs for the pharaohs to rest in. In the same way that we have tombstones in cemeteries, this was just a giant tombstone. And the bigger your pyramid, obviously the more important and valuable you were. So this process of building these giant pyramids was undertaken many, many years, oftentimes uh, before pharaohs even died because they knew that their time to be buried would be very short, whereas the time they were reigning and alive was very long and they would need to be able to, when they died, go directly into their pyramid. The Egyptians have this very strained and strange relationship with Nubia. There's a competition over the Nile trade. Since Nubia is in the south and Egypt's in the north, they're going to kind of uh, compete for trade along the Nile. There's military conflict, about five of them, plus or minus that much, between 3100 and 2600 BCE. Uh, but the Egyptians eventually went and drive the Nubians to the south. In the south, they establish uh, the kingdom of Kush uh, around 2500 BCE. Uh, they continue to trade and have cultural influences that continue between them, despite their having some military conflict with one another. Because your neighbors, they obviously uh, are going to need to still trade with each other. They're going to still impact each other in religious matters and cultural matters and social matters. But what they're going to need to do is uh, find ways to get along to get along. Now, under the new, new kingdom, a few pyramids were built, but major monumental architectural projects were built, like temples and uh, different uh, large-scale monuments to uh, the gods, to the pharaohs, to different people. Uh, they engaged in empire building to protect against foreign invasion. If you're going to have, like we talked about in the past with Mesopotamia, uh, a lot of uh, resources, well, you're going to have a lot of people who eventually want to take those resources. And the best way to do uh, the protecting of those resources is to go around and build an empire. An empire is a group of people that are banded together under one uh, authority or one leader. And they're able to protect against foreign invasion because if one of you is attacked, they're able to band together and send troops and take care of each other. After the New Kingdom, local resistance drives Egypt out of Nubia. So Nubia actually pushes uh, back uh, Egypt, and the Kingdom of Kush revives around 1100 BCE. There is an invasion of Kushites, Assyrians, and they eventually will destroy Egypt in the mid-6th century BCE. So Egypt as part of the uh, Egyptian Empire is actually destroyed by the Nubians after um, some different invasions around uh, the years uh, of the mid-6th mid century BCE. The Egyptian urban culture, there were major cities along the Nile River, especially at the Delta, 
like I talked about before, Memphis was built around 3100 BCE. Heliopolis or Heliopolis uh, is 2900 BCE. The Nubian cities include Kirma, Napta, Mero. They're located at the cataracts of the Nile. The cataracts are kind of like these uh, rapids or um, what we would consider like white water rapids, like where rocks kind of push the water up into the sky and make like a foaming. Um, this is designed to kind of not allow for a, um, a invasion through the river, but also to protect you. And you're able to gain a lot of resources because you still have the Nile. Uh, in Egypt, Egypt, they had well-defined social classes. Everyone knew their place from the pharaohs all the way down to the slaves. Everyone knew their jobs, knew where they belonged in society. Through archaeological discoveries in Nubia, uh, they also support a class-based society. We have a lot less information about Nubia than we do about Egypt. Uh, they built a lot more things, especially the monumental architecture. They built a lot of things that survive even to this day. Like if you were to go to Egypt, you would see the pyramids, whereas the Nubian society had very little in the way of long-lasting um, cultural uh, pieces and archaeological uh, evidence left behind. Patriarchal societies, uh, both they are notable exceptions because the fam female pharaoh Hapshepshut, it always takes that out of me to try and say her name, uh, she ruled from 1473 to 1458 BCE, very, very influential and powerful woman uh, in this patriarchal society, and so men had to finally listen to women in this culture. They end up getting to economic specialization. That's our big kind of theme and overarching idea that kind of takes up these first eight chapters. That bronze metallurgy is introduced late with Hyskos invasion from the Hyskos. Uh, they develop iron early around 900 BCE. There's trade along the Nile River, and it's more difficult in Nubia due to those cataracts, those uh, bubbling and rock-filled parts of the river. But eventually they'll get sea trade in the Mediterranean, especially in the northern half where Egypt, the kingdom of Egypt, used to be. And what's uh, that special about the economic specialization is as society develops, if you're having economic specialization, what you're getting is people who know what they're doing. And a lot more people are valuable based on the goods and services that they provide rather than just being farmers who are trading to other farmers. Hieroglyphs are holy inscriptions. Their writing appears at least by 3200 BCE. They have pictographic supplemented with symbols uh, representing sounds and ideas. So if you've ever seen a very famous picture of like Egypt or you put, remember back to your books in, in elementary school with pictures of Egypt, they were symbols that oftentimes looked like birds or sun, the sun or lines or snakes and all these different things. They were pictographic, meaning that they represented uh, the item that they were drawn as. So, for example, if you drew this little symbol, then obviously that symbol is a bird. You don't have to spell out B-I-R-D or make out the symbols. You just draw a bird, and the people knew what that meant. It was supplemented with symbols representing sounds and ideas. So, uh, for example, many of you know from math the symbol pi, right? And pi represents a number, and it's also a idea that it's a, uh, I don't remember exactly what it's for, but you probably know that pi is an important part of the maths. And so when you see pi, you know what that means. And it, in, it actually holds within it a lot more meaning than just uh, the letter itself, which is pi, the sound that it makes. Uh, hieroglyphs survive on the monuments, the building, and sheets of papyrus. This is another form of evidence that the Egyptians have that the uh, Nubian society doesn't have as much of. Uh, the hieroglyphs are for formal writing. Hier Hieratic script is for everyday affairs, and it's used from 2600 BCE to 600 CE. So if you were to see the laws of the court, for example, they were probably written in hieroglyphs. But if you were to see, for example, how much grain one person trained to another grain, it, another tra how much grain a trader traded to another trader in the trading square, it would have been Heratic script used from 2600 to 600 CE. The Greek alphabet eventually is adoptic, adopted, and Demotic and Coptic scripts are used as well. And Mirortic, Meritic mer, mm, writing is a flexible system borrowed from hieroglyphs and represents sounds rather than ideas. It's still very hard for us to translate uh, Meritic writing. 
Uh, next is development of organized religious tradition. The principal gods of the area were Amun and Ra, Re, or Ra, as I always learned it in school, but same idea. Uh, both represent the sun, and both were worshipped equally as a, as a gods, but they were the, the chief gods amongst many other gods, and so there was a polytheism to their religious tradition. Religious turmoil comes under Am Amenhotep the uh, fourth. He changes his name to Akhaten, who ruled from 1353 to 1335 BCE. He actually introduces the sole worship of the sun god Aten. And so Aten is, according to uh, Akhaten, uh, the only god in the world. And since he's the only god in the world, all the other gods are false. And what we only need to worship is Aten, and we need to focus on him. This sounds a lot like another culture that we've studied in the past. And uh, this is one of the er world's earliest expressions of monotheism, that there is only one god and all the other gods don't exist. There's the, at the death of Akhaten, traditional priests or the old priests of Amon and Re uh, restore the cult to the principal point within the society. And many people go back to worshiping just Amon and Re or Amon Ra. And uh, yeah, so that was a very small window into monotheism as early as uh, 1350s BCE. Uh, the Egyptians were very focused and fascinated with mummification and the afterlife. They are inspired by the cycles of the Nile. Then every year the Nile grows and it floods and it's full of life and it's full of fish. And when it comes, it brings more life because it feeds our farms and it feeds our cows and it feeds our families and makes us very healthy. And then after a while, it slowly drains and then it dies and it stops being so full and it's kind of uh, full of death. Some of the fish don't make it out and they die and rot. And you can uh, see that that cycle of life, death, rebirth is something that gets very intertwined in the way the Egyptians look at the world. They believe in the revival of the dead, that uh, eventually the dead will come back to life either in this world or the next, and that uh, it was very important that when you died, you had your body and the things that were a part of your body very near you so you could be put back together. That is why uh, the mummification process was actually like preserving uh, for being literally thousands of years old mummies are in amazing shape because of salt and because of some of the preservatives that they were able to use uh, through Egypt and uh, first the ruling classes were mummified but eventually it's expanded out to the lower classes are going to become mummified and this is all in association with the cult of Osiris uh, Osiris was the lord of the underworld who held the power to determine who deserved immortality. And so if you were a good person and you honored Osiris, then maybe Osiris would grant you an eternal reward for those who had led a moral life. Uh, this is kind of the early ideas that your God that you worship, if you do the right things, will reward you with the idea of eternal happiness or eternal um, joy in the next life or even bring you back to have eternal happiness in this life. Uh, the Nubians worship Abdenmak and seb u <laughs> These names, man, they're such uh, tongue twisters. Then we're going to get and shift a little bit to the Bantu migrations. This is 3000 to 1000 BCE. The Bantu, or people, uh, they have migration throughout sub-Saharan regions, so south of the Sahara in like the w southwestern parts of uh, Africa. And they're going to travel basically because of population pressure. They have too many people and they need to move and grow and spread out. There are over 500 variations of the original Bantu language spoken throughout all of Africa by over 90 million speakers. By 1000 BCE, it, they occupy most of Africa and south of the equator. Here's a quick map showing the original Bantu homeland, that greenish section in uh, West Africa. And you can see that the Bantu migrations actually spread out south and southeast of the area and eventually making it all the way to the very tip, the bottom of Africa. Bantu religions, there's evidence of early monotheism, believing that there was one god that was good and evil and that they oversaw, that god oversaw the people's lives and that uh, the god kind of could be swayed in one way or another to care about individual people's lives. 
The Bantus also had deistic views as well, as well that, and deism is where you believe that God might exist, and if God does exist, he probably is really busy doing some other things, or maybe he just made you on a whim. So, for example, uh, many deists believe that there is a God or gods, and they, they made us, and they made the world, and they made the universe, but then they got kind of bored, and they just left. They, and they're not really concerned with our individual lives because we're just like, for example, ants in an ant farm. You might go over and look at them for a while, but you're not super uh, involved in their lives. You don't really care what they're thinking, what they're feeling. You don't really care if they worship you or not. You're just kind of up there doing your own thing. And even if you did were to care, you're so transcendent and far above them, it doesn't really matter that much to even intercede and try and help them. Yet, the Bantus did, uh, some of them believe that they could pray to intercessors or people who could speak on behalf of the people. And by praying to those intercessors, the gods would hear them or God would hear them and uh, would act in an appropriate way, whether bringing rain or more crops or whatever it may be. And they also uh, pray to ancestor spirits, which are those an intercessors. So people have already gone on to the next life. Well, they're just sitting around with nothing to do, and but they're a lot closer to God than we are. So maybe we should pray to them. And, and on our behalf, maybe our uncle or our great-great-grandma or somebody can go to God and beg our, our case uh, to the God of the world or the universe, and maybe they'll do something about our problems. And yet there was great variation among the populations. Not everyone practiced the same religion in the Bantu areas. Not everyone practiced the same uh, actions, the same rituals, the same sacrifices. Everyone kind of did their own thing as they spread out and got farther and farther away from one another. This is the evolution of religion through the Bantu peoples. Like I said, this is a short lecture. When you finish studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Explain the connections between climate, agriculture, and the Nile River and the development of Egypt and Nubia. How come the climate and the agriculture of the area that we were studying was affected by the Nile River? And why was it a uh, better process in Egypt versus in Nubia? Next, understand the historical development of Egypt from the unification to the fall of the New Kingdom. So all the way from the beginning of Egypt, so what happened? and then kind of get all the way to the New Kingdom when it falls to Nubian society. I would draw a little timeline, make sure you know where everybody falls in that timeline. Next, outline the emergence of cities and stratified society. How did uh, cities kind of evolve and where did they evolve, especially in Egypt? And then how did society kind of break up and why did they believe that society was uh, like broken up into sections? Next, identify significant aspects of Egyptian economic specialization and trade and the development of early writing. Uh, focus on specifically how Egyptian peoples ended up having very specialized jobs and then they would eventually use those jobs to make trade and how come they were using writing as a part of trade. It's, it's very closely linked with the uh, information we talked about in the past. Next, discuss key features of Egyptian religious traditions. Who were they praying to? Why were they praying to them? Who were the chief gods? Who were some of the uh, kind of peripheral gods, the gods on the side that were super important still? and kind of why were they doing what they were doing. Next, describe the dynamics of Bantu expansion and early agricultural societies in sub-Saharan Africa. So as we looked about a uh, northern uh, section of Africa above the Sahara, we're looking at Egypt and the Nubian society. Now we need to look in sub-Saharan Africa, kind of where the Bantu are expanding, and look at why, uh, how, their how and why their society grew in the way that it did. Your writing assignment, five days short sentences. Number one, compare and contrast Egyptian and Nubian society. I draw a T-chart. Why is there so much more known about Egypt? Come up with at least five good reasons. You can do five if you're really ambitious. I'll say three. That sounds like a pretty good number to me. Make sure you just have those three locked down. Number two, Herodotus said that Egypt was the gift of the Nile. What does this mean? In what ways did the Nile affect Egyptian culture? How did the, would Egypt have existed without the Nile? That's something to really think about. Number three, agriculture spread through sub-Saharan Africa considerably later than it did through other parts of the world. Why do you think this is so? Come up with at least three possible explanations. We'll talk about these all in class. I'm going to go ahead and let you stop here, take a break, uh, reread your chapter, and then come on back to the same video for chapter four. Bye. Hi, and welcome back. We're going to continue on with Chapter 4, Early, Early Societies in South Asia. Here's our overview. Uh, early Societies in South Asia. 
An agricultural economy and its accompanying Neolithic communities emerged on the Indian subcontinent sometime after 7000 BCE. Eventually, some of the Neolithic villages further evolved into urban societies. The earliest such society was Dravidian and was known as the Harappan Society. It flourished along the Indus River Valley in the 3rd millennium BCE. Coinciding with the decline of the Harappan society, large numbers of Indo-European migrants moved into India from Central Asia beginning around 1900 BCE. These people, known as Aryans, brought with them cultural traditions sharply different from the earlier societies. After a period of turmoil, the Aryan and Dravidian cultures merged into generate a distinctive Indian society characterized by the following. Regional states with kingship, Raj, Rajas, sorry, as the most common form of government. The caste system, a complex social class system that served as a vehicle for imparting a powerful sense of group identity as a stabilizing influence in Indian society and as a foundation for the religious belief system. A distinctive set of religious beliefs encompassing the doctrines of samsara and karma along with the notion of a universal soul, or Brahman. And finally, a rich literary religious tradition based on centuries of oral transmission that included such classics as the Vedas and the Upanishads. So first up, we have the Harappan Society and its neighbors, circa 2000 BCE. You can see Egypt. They're the green section on our far left. Uh, they're going to be kind of out of the way a little bit. The Mesopotamia, a little more uh, connected to what we just talked about in Chapter 2. And now we're moving to the Harappan Society, which is that large purple section right in the center. Uh, you can see highlighted there is the Khyber Pass. It's going to become very important very soon. That runs through the Hindu Kush Mountains. And then we have Mohojindaro. And we're going to see these purple lines. These are trade routes. We're going to talk about those eventually. But for right now, we're going to keep that on this back burner. First up, uh, foundations of Harappan society, the Indus River. The Indus River is very important to world history because it's the foundation of uh, kind of the start of where people are starting to settle. And the Indus River is a silt-enriched water from mountain ranges. Again, it's that wearing away by uh, the waters that are rescinding after those ice ages that we talked about. And... It's also going to leave deposits of silt, which has lots of nutrients, and also that sweet, valuable water that's used for growing um, agriculture. And we talked about in class how agriculture is a cornerstone of uh, growing a society and a culture overall. Major society built the, by the Dravidian peoples from 3000 to 2500 BCE. There's the cultivation of cotton before 5000 BCE, and the early cultivation of poultry, or like chickens and small birds, those sorts of things. It's in decline after 1900 BCE, and its major cities are Harappa in the Punjab region today, and the Mohen Mohenjo-Daro, it's at the mouth at the uh, Indus River. As you can kind of start to see the pattern that's emerging, the rivers that we are talking about and all the civilizations that we keep talking about grow up along the side of the rivers. I want you to keep in mind, why do you think that uh, the societies that we are discussing all seem to be centered around rivers or river valleys? Uh, there are 70 smaller sites that were excavated in total. There was about 1,500 smaller sites. These are the foundations or the start of the Harappan society. Uh, we're going to kind of move on from there now. The Mohenjo-Daro ruins. Population was about 40,000, very large for its time. It was a regional center, meaning that it was uh, part of a larger community, but it was the center of trade, commerce. It had a layout and architecture that suggests a public purpose. If you think about your home... Uh, your home isn't really designed to allow for, like, let's say, hundreds of thousands of people to move through. But if you look at, like, our school, for example, there are wide hallways, there are wide open spaces, there are many tables, there's trash cans. There's all these things that are designed to show that a public use for those buildings is planned. So even if you couldn't read, for example, the language, like English, and you came back to Cerritos thousands of years later, you could probably, if you had the layout, figure out, it was a public area, and it was used for public uh, good. It also had broad streets, which means that they were very wide. They had a citadel or a very tall tower. What's cool about citadels is they're designed to be lookout points as well as defensible positions. They're usually built on hills. They're very tall towers where they kept weapons and other sorts of um, defensible uh, parts. And the citadel could also hold monies. It could hold different things just depending on what culture we're talking about. But the citadel, uh, for this instance, is able to see far away, so you can see if troops are massing on your southern border or whatever. It had a pool, 
Now with this pool, it suggests that they were collecting the water, using it for the public good, and one of my favorite things in world history is sewage. It had a very good way of transporting out sewage. Imagine a world where sewage is not efficiently managed. You guys would hate to have to live next to a place where uh, all of the community's bathroom ended up, and that's kind of gross, but this is awesome because the Mohenjo-Daro ruins actually had a way to process sewage out of their community. Very cool. They use standardized weights <clears throat> evident throughout the region. What's nice about these standardized weights is that uh, if you were to go from town to town or center to center or wherever and you were to trade, you knew exactly how much of a certain good you were getting in exchange for a certain amount of money. So, for example, in our society, we use pounds in America. And so we know that pounds are a certain amount of ounces. There are a certain amount of... Uh, like weights in terms of how much you get for a certain good we know that the water pounds are uh, the same as like say a pound of wheat a pound of feathers everything is standardized and it only adjusts based on the good that you're receiving this is very good to ensure that society runs smoothly people aren't feeling very ripped off they had specialized labor as we've talked about before and they did have some trade harappan society and culture there's evidence of social stratification, or there's people at the top, people at the bottom. And then we know this because of the dwelling sizes and decoration. We've been able to do some excavation through archaeology and understand that uh, the bigger your house, even like today, the probably the more um, valuable to the society you were, or even how much money you had, and the decoration within those um, dwellings. If you have lots of paintings on the walls, or you even have some sort of decoration to your walls, obviously that takes more time, energy, effort. You have to hire specialized craftsmen to come in and do that work. And if you were able to uh, have the money and excess capital or excess money to do that, then obviously you're a very important person. Harappan civilization later will influence uh, Indian culture, uh, they have statues in the Harappan society. They have figurines and illustrations that reflect a tradition of art and metallurgy. So these are people who are well past the hunter-gatherer stage, and they're actually reflecting back, doing art, mixing metal together, making stronger uh, weapons and tools. And they venerated a goddess of fertility. I want you to kind of pay attention to that because we've talked about a, another type of goddess of fertility, and I want you to be able to uh, bring that up when we start discussing this. Now, we have this weird thing that happened. It's the mysterious end of the Harappan civilization. Their reasons for disappearing were unclear. We, we know there was excess deforestation, which leads to a loss of topsoil. This is going to come up again. When you clear away trees, uh, trees have very deep roots. And when you tear away those roots, the topsoils are uh, where all the nutrients to uh, crops sit and rest especially if you think about like the silt that we've been talking about. If you take away a lot of the trees, the winds can come by and take away all those minerals and nutrients, which leads to a loss of those uh, nutrients going into your food. There might have been some earthquakes. We're not 100% sure on that because the civilization disappeared. There might have been some flooding as a result of some of that uh, topsoil loss or some of that changes in their environment. We have some evidence of this one of these two instances because of unburied dead we found beds that aren't buried honored uh through ritual they're just kind of laying in what we would know as like the streets uh their disappearance is around 1500 bce and harappan traditions survived there's agricultural practices that the harappans used there were religious beliefs and there was urban traditions that were carried over even after the harappans disappeared from the earth this leads us to the early aryans uh they were a pastoral economy they used sheep goats, horses, cattle. Uh, cattle will not become sacred to the Ar to the Aryans until many centuries later. So today in India, cattle are oftentimes uh, venerated or they are seen as sacred and they're not to be harmed, they're not to be hurt. And yet uh, this isn't the case for the early Aryans who will eventually become uh, the forerunners to the modern Indian peoples. Uh, there were religious and literary works, the Vedas. Uh, Sanskrit actually shows up around this time. It's the sacred tongue of the religions and the people. Uh, Prakrit is the everyday language evolved into Hindi, Urdu, and Bengali. So if you speak Hindi, Urdu, or Bengali, the original like root language of this is Prakrit. And uh, if you were to see it today, you probably wouldn't recognize it exactly, but you could probably pick out a few sounds and symbols and words here and there. They eventually get to the four Vedas, or the four wisdoms, with the most important being the Rig Veda. Uh, there's 120 or 100, 1,028 hymns to Aryan gods. So these are songs 
and stories that are related to the Aryan gods that uh, tell their tell their history, tell what they do, tell their jobs in the universe, and uh, this becomes very important as we go throughout the history of India. This is what leads us to what we've known as the Vedic Age or the Vedic Age. Conflicts between Aryans and an indigenous Dasas, which are known also as enemies or subjects, that's what the word translates to. There are Aryans fighting Dravidians, also Aryans fighting each other. This is showing that the Vedic Age is uh, kind of summed up in the idea of there's conflict. There were chiefdoms or rajas where there were people clicking off into smaller groups and able to protect themselves, work together, and to defend themselves against one another. Uh, there is an early concentration in the Punjab region and then uh, migrations further south. There ends up in this area and in this time a development of iron metallurgy. Again, iron is very important because it's very strong, very usable, able to make weapons, tools, all those awesome things. There's an increasing reliance on agriculture through this time. Uh, we talked about how uh, hunting and gathering is, is good for a while, but it's not efficient to build a large-scale society, and they start to lean more heavily away from their pastoral roots to the agricultural route to feed their people that are just growing. Tribal connections evolve into political structures, so if you think about these rajas and these small chiefdoms, eventually they're going to kind of connect because one group will probably uh, work very closely with the other group, and by... Uh, having those tribal connections, maybe groups working together, this will lead into political structures that uh, show higher and lower uh, levels in a society. Varna is the caste system. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this part of the lecture, I want you to kind of make sure you focus on this uh, system. It's going to come up again and again, even to modern day India. Uh, there's origins in the Aryan domination of the Dravidians. So there are a couple classes I want to talk about. The first is the Brahmin class, which is at the top. This is the priest class. Obviously, the Brahmins are uh, very important. We talked about in class how uh, priests can be very influential in a society because religion is a very powerful thing. If you're worried about what the gods want or you're worried about how to make your crops grow or to make the rain come or whatever it is, you're going to need somebody who can kind of like be special and see beyond, and that's what those priests are representing. Uh, the Brahmins have a very special way of looking at the world, and not only do they provide um, clarity on what the gods want, they can also point us in the direction in, in this culture of what it might be to have a happy afterlife, or when we die, what is kind of the greater uh, place we can go, and how do we get there? So the priests are helpful in that. Next we have Keshratya. I always say that word wrong, Krishratya, which means warrior. These are people who are obviously protecting the society. These are warriors who go out and fight. Again, you'd see why they're at the top. They're obviously protecting the things that we don't want to lose, like our family, our farms, whatever it is. Uh, they're very important and influential to the society because they are taking care of the people. Va Vaishaya, uh, yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, merchant. These are important people as well because they're buying, they're trading, and the reason they're kind of higher on this chain is because they are the ones who are gaining wealth. If you think about, for example, a store, uh, people who own stores make lots of money. They are able to buy and sell things. They're able to collect money because they have a good that can be traded, and these merchants become very influential through this caste system. Then we have Shudra, which are serfs. These are people who work the land. They oftentimes are working as um, tenement farmers, which means that they're getting some of the goods of their labor. So if you're a farmer and you're working on a land and you're a serf, you're being protected by those warriors. You're being uh, like prayed for by the priests. But at the same time, you're kind of uh, going around and you're farming so that you can stay alive. And then the excess that you farm goes to your landlord or the people in charge of the land. From there, we have Jati system of subclass. Uh, this is related to urbanization and increasing social economic com complexity. Uh, some of the lowest people on the totem pole are obviously things that people don't like, like the people who are in charge of collecting and changing out the sewer systems, people who are in charge of collecting the dead. Even to this day, many of the people who are um, in charge of burning bodies or in charge of uh, processing the dead, as what happens in India, are in some of the lower sections of the Jati. It was patriarchal in ancient Indian society. This starts with the rule of the father. It's a social order that stood alongside the caste system and the Varna hierarchy. So if you were a part of certain subcastes or castes within uh, Indian society, there was also this idea that men were still better than women. Uh, it's enforced in the law book of Manu. Uh, women were to be subject to fathers, husbands, and sons in that specific order. 
and women's most important duties were to bear children and maintain wholesome homes. So there is this role for women to be done, but at the same time, women don't have a very uh, large voice within the community. In the Aryan religion, the major deity of Rigveda is Indra, the war god. Uh, obviously, since warriors are so high on the caste system, this war god, this going out and destroying and taking, become a part of uh, the Aryan religion very early on. They have elaborate ritual sacrifices to the gods, and that's where that role of the Brahmins becomes very important. If you want to make the gods happy, you better do exactly what the gods want so that they will be happy and not make bad things happen to you. So you need to have the Brahmins who can uh, sacrifice for you, or they can bring about certain types of knowledge that you can take and do in your daily life to make the gods happy. Around 800 BCE, some movement is away from sacrificial cults. Uh, we start to see that they're not getting into uh, sacrificing in like the classical sense like the Hebrews had or like some of the other cultures we've studied where they uh, killed meat or animals to be able to please the gods. Uh, they move towards what's like a mystical thought. It's influenced by Dravidians that there's a certain way to think or there's a certain way to be inside of yourself that will make the gods happy happy and also will make your life better and this will eventually lead to some of the early uh, interpretations of Hinduism. Next we have the teachings of the Upanishads. There are texts that uh, represent a, plen a blending of Aryan and Dravidian tradition. These are composed around 800 to 400 BCE. Some later collections are all the way up until the 13th century for they're writing this for thousands of years. What they highlight is a couple different things, or at least four specific things. Uh, first is the Brahman. Uh, this is the universal soul. In the uh, teaching of the Upanishads, it's this idea that everybody and every life in the universe comes from uh, this universal soul. There's one soul, and that when it's our time to be born, or what, when animals' times are to be born, or whatever's alive, there's some pieces of that universal soul that are broken off and injected into our world, and that is why there's life on this world. Uh, this is the belief that uh, everybody kind of comes from one source. It's kind of a cool idea. From there, we get to samsara, which is reincarnation. Uh, if everybody comes from this universal soul, and there's this kind of just like big like liquid cup in the sky full of souls and life, then obviously uh, there's going to be needing to be a return to that reincarnation or, or re re return to the universal soul. And what will eventually happen is, uh, as we lived our lives, let's say you live your life now as, as a student, and you grow up, and let's say you're a good person, and you make the gods happy, and everything works out well for you. Well, when you die, you might come back as like a better caste, or you might come back as a warrior, or a rich person, or you might live a, a more comfortable life the next time around. But if, let's say, you lived your life as a bad person, you stole from people, you beat people up, you killed people, well, then you're going to move down the cast line, and in, in very specific punishments, eventually, if you were a bad enough person, you could move down to, like, animals, and you could become, like, a bug or a fly or something. And that would be bad, obviously. Karma is this idea that comes out for accounting for incarnations, that there's good karma, there's bad karma, there's good action, there's bad action. The more good actions you do, you kind of build up, like, in a bank account. Think of it as deposits. And bad karma is like negative accounts, so like withdrawals. And as long as you have like a positive account of karma at the end of your life when you die and you return to the Brahman, when you get re-injected after samsara to our world, then you're going to end up either better or worse. There's moksha, which is mystical ecstasy. It's this idea that um, you will reach this like level of happiness that's like very mystical and very outside of what we would understand. Like if you guys ever had like... Uh, your favorite food, like one of my favorite things in the world is like quarter pounders from McDonald's. And, you know, when you get a bite after you've been really hungry of your favorite food, you're going to have that moment of like, oh, that's so good. But uh, moksha is like a transcendent or like a next level of happiness and ecstasy that can't be really attained by like simple things like food or or friendship or whatever it may be that makes us happy. Uh, but moksha is something that is only understood through the, the teachings of this religion and that by having certain understandings and certain views on the world and certain like feelings within ourselves, then we'll get to that like very special level of feeling better. Uh, they have a relationship to the system of Varna, uh, that caste style system, and we'll talk about that a little more as we get deeper into India. 
So we made it to the end. When you finish studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Explain their origins of Harappan society in the Indus River Valley. Where did they come from? Why are they there? What are they doing? Kind of give me an outline of that. Next, identify the features of Harappan society and culture and discuss theories behind Harappan decline. Uh, what do we think happened to them? And what were some of the things that they did that was so influential? Next, understand the Indo-European migrations and the development of early Aryan India. How did people show up to India? Uh, what was the first like kind of expression of India and through the Aryan peoples? Then outline the origins of the caste system and the development of patriarchal society. Where did the caste system come from and what are the levels? Make sure you know who goes where and why and what is their role within that level. Then finally, identify the key elements of Aryan religious belief and practices and their blending with Dravidian values. What are uh, some of the values that the Dravidians had and how did that get blended with Aryan beliefs and how did they get expressed, especially in that last slide we just talked about, uh, how does that influence later India? It, I mean, obviously, if you know anything about India, you can see how it influences it heavily even to this day. Here's your writing assignment. Write a short five to eight sentences to the following questions. Number one. There are a few names of prominent individuals included in this chapter. Why is that so? So why is there not really any names of people? We'll talk about people a lot throughout world history, but why is there not so many names? In this chapter, what is it about the nature of society and the available historical sources that makes it difficult to discern individuals within those societies? Uh, what were the advantages of the caste system to the development of Indian societies during this time period? Why do you believe the system managed to persist for a millennia? Why do you think it kept going for so long uh, even to this day, and why uh, are there advantages to this caste system? Like, why is it good? I think there's some positive things, and there are definitely some negative things to the caste system, but why would they see it as a positive? Then finally, the religious beliefs of this period emerged as a result of blending of Aryan and Dravidian traditions and significant developments in the later Vedic age. These beliefs were an underpinnings of the Hindu religion, which is still the most prevalent rel region, religion of the Indian subcontinent. What aspects of this belief system make it so appealing to people? How did it both reflect and support other social institutions? The, the caste system itself is a reflection of these religious beliefs. So we made it to the end, two chapters very quick. Uh, I'll hopefully be able to see you guys very soon. Uh, go ahead and do your questions, reread your chapters. We're gonna go ahead and keep getting closer to that uh, first test that we're gonna be working on. I hope you guys study hard. I'll talk to you soon, bye.